seem to remember being like 16 years old and having an album with a song that I was crazy about called Incense and Peppermints. Oh and I hear that Strawberry Alarm Clock, uh, you're in a kind of a reunion phase. Um, actually, I was never really part of the band. Um, when I was 14, I wrote songs with my neighbor, and my neighbor became the bass player in the band, and after they had had their first Incense and Peppermint single, they needed songs for an album, so... Um, they took our songs and, and used them on the album and consequently invited both he and I to join the band. And my mother wouldn't let me. I was 14. I, you know, <laughs> I don't, at the time I wasn't really happy about it, but I don't blame her now and I'm actually glad of her decision. Last, last year before last, um, a, a job came up that was the Iron Butterfly and the Vanilla Fudge and Strawberry Alarm Clock. And so, George, the bass player, who's kind of been holding it together, um, called me and said, would I be interested in playing along too? I played flute on the first album too, besides having my songs oh. on there. Um, so I said, yeah, I mean, anything to go see those three, th those other two bands together, I thought that'd be great. Yeah. The gig fell through. We started rehearsing. We kind of liked it. We got the original keyboard player involved. So we had a uh, bass player, drummer, original keyboard player, uh, a new guitar player, and me, who's kind of like halfway in between doing it and then we get then we got hold of the original one of the original singers who was living in San Francisco and as we were rehearsing um we got a call from Roger Ebert an email and uh, Roger Ebert did a movie called Beyond the Valley of the Dolls and the Strawberry Alarm Clock after actually everybody that I knew had quit the band no actually two of the guys the keyboard player and the guitar player were still in the band um were in the movie they're playing in the movie. Doing th so he made a request that we come and play at the end of his... He has a festival every year in Champaign, Illinois. And if we play after they show that movie. So we contacted even other people who had been members of the Strawberry Alarm Clock, a, a, guitar, a guitar player who's now a bass player in a local country band. And then Ed King, who was the original guitar player who wrote Sweet Home Alabama for Leonard Skinner, has rooms full of guitars, and, but he won't fly for good reason. Um, and he traveled to, he, he met us in Champaign, Illinois. So in Champaign, Illinois, we had like nine or ten members of the Starboard Long Clock, and we did uh, an hour concert after this movie, and it was, everybody, oh. we had a good time. We may have a tour booked in August with, uh, Pete, we, we played this thing in San Diego on Peter and Gordon, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Peter and Gordon kind of liked, mm -hmm. got along with us, and we may be doing a tour with, them in August is the last I heard. We're also w wondering about uh, Oingo Boingo, if there's going to be a reunion there. Some of us, the drummer, the bass player, and the saxophone player, have gotten together and done a few tribute shows on Halloween, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, actually the, uh, Brendan McCurry, the guy um, I've been playing with too, um, do a bunch of old Boingo songs for, for Halloween shows, because that's what we were known for here. Mm, okay. But the chances of a reunion are, yeah, I really know. Uh, from the bands to writing scores for film, that seems to be a big chunk of your your career. That, and we were kind of wondering um, how you ended up going down that path. At the end of high school, I was going to be a, a doctor. I went, I, I uh, started UCLA as a pre-med, you know, whatever the science major stuff. After a couple of weeks, I realized that I couldn't stand the blood and guts of even the biology class of having to dissect uh, cockroaches. You know, oh, yeah, it's like. Well, there's a tip-off. Yes, that was a tip-off, <laughs> so, so I switched majors, became a music major, and got a degree in composition from UCLA. And then, um, Danny. Uh, I got connected with Oingo Boingo through an old friend's brother who was playing trumpet with Oingo Boingo. Um, and Oingo Boingo at that time was a street theater group. Hmm. They would play in front of Andy Warhol movie openings or the Artist Models Ball downtown and, and in San Francisco. And uh, I went... he. They had lost their guitar player, and, they, and Danny was trying to put together a show, Danny Elfman, put together a show that was more, that featured more real musicians, because most of them were just, you know, flailers and, and yeah. more theater people. Like performance art. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he got a few of us, a, a drummer, a, a bass player, a piano player, me and Sam, the sax player, that were kind of soloists in one of the prerequisites was being able to play kind of Django Reinhardt stuff, because that mm -hmm. was what he wanted to do in the show. So I went and auditioned. I got, I got the audition and slowly became music. Um, well, actually, what happened is we had a show at a place in Hollywood that the, um, the night before the show was supposed to go on, it, the place burned down. Oh, no. Except for, our, luckily enough, our equipment was in a fireproof room inside the theater. So our equipment 
made it, but the, other, the rest of it didn't. And it set us back a ways, and that, oh. that was when Danny gave me the official title of um, music director oh. <laughs> so that I would stay with it and not split. Yeah. And uh, then we, at one point we switched to rock and roll and became a rock and roll band. The funny thing about Danny and I is we had similar um, interests as we grew up. Uh, one was Balinese and Jam- Javanese gamelan, uh, yeah, sure. the percussion instrument orchestras. And the other was film music. Uh, Nina Rhoda and Bernard Herrmann were both our favorites. So he, at one point in the uh, as the band was doing okay. I mean, every year the band was one of those things that every year we'd get a little a better response, make a little bit more money that we could actually live on, mm-hmm. but we were never a hit, you know. Um, so at, at one point he was looking for a film to do, and he got um, picked up by uh, Paul Rubens who pushed him into the Tim Burton film and he said all the right things to the directors and got, got hired for that and suddenly he realized, well, I don't know how to film. And uh, he dragged me along mm-hmm. because I'd had a degree in composition and orchestration that I would like, oh, okay. you know, kind of clean up stuff as he did it. Yeah. And we both learned on that project a whole lot from, um, particularly from the uh, music editor, um, Bob Adamy, and from Lenny Niehaus who conducted and actually finished my orchestrations. Um, and uh, so that, that whole process was like this huge learning curve where we started out with him just banging on the piano to where he was playing to a click track, track and I was doing adjustments with the music editor. It was just really a great experience. And after that, because the movie did well, it's like, well, Danny turned to me and said, well, why don't we learn as we earn? And we started doing a few TV shows and, mm-hmm. and got involved that way. Um, at one point, Danny's agent asked if I was interested in film. And I, at that point, said, I don't want to make anything to do with it. I'm not emotionally prepared to deal with directors the way Danny can. And a few years later, of course, I recanted, and, and, and then I ended up doing a, a few small movies on my own, too.